Hello everyone, bringing you a video today which is a result of a request for another in the series of Fallout for Real videos which I've made some time ago uh, looking at the Fallout 4 video game universe and sort of parallels that can be found in the real world US of the 1950s and 1960s. Definitely a nuke happy time uh, in the US. There was still the feeling that nuclear energy was going to be the solution to all of mankind's problems and tactical nuclear weapons of all sorts of different varieties were being designed and tested and there was a genuine intention to use these and obviously manoeuvres of troops in uh, on a nuclear battlefield were, were practised, the Nevada test site and so forth. Some quite famous footage came out of that. So the parallels that can be, t be drawn between the real world and obviously what it inspired in the, the Fallout universe are quite interesting. This video doesn't do that unfortunately, but nevertheless it's of the same sort of uh, subject matter in early US tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, it, I couldn't find a parallel in the, the Fallout universe, but nevertheless, hopefully what we're going to look at in this video will be of interest. As well as my interest in the Cold War in general, and obviously tactical nuclear weapons and so forth, this also fits in with my interest in battleships, particularly their use post-Second World War, which is quite an interesting topic. During the Second World War, it's been well demonstrated that the aircraft carrier had really gained ascendancy over the battleship in terms of naval warfare. The line of battle was really seen to be a thing of the past, but battleships did linger on in the larger navies. They'd been quite useful for shore bombardment duties, and they were still something of a prestige weapon. The Royal Navy would lose its last battleship, of course, in 1960, with HMS Vanguard being decommissioned in June of that year. However, the US maintained its Iowa-class ships throughout the Cold War, and they would be in commission on and off throughout the period, uh, most notably during the 1980s, uh, in response to the Soviet Union's Kirov-class guided missile cruisers. This period in commission through to the early 1990s would be the last for the Iowas, though a spectacular one with the ships providing naval gunfire support and launching strikes using Tomahawk cruise missiles during the Gulf War before final decommissioning. So how are the Iowas linked to nuclear weapons technology? The Tomahawk missiles can deliver a nuclear warhead, but what we're going to consider dates back to the early years of the Cold War and much earlier tactical nuclear weapons. In the late 1940s, the US was very keen to field a nuclear-capable artillery piece. At the time, limited ability to miniaturise the nuclear warhead necessitated a large projectile, and consequently a large gun. So the M65 atomic cannon was born, otherwise known as Atomic Annie. The design drew some elements from the German K5 railway gun, infamous as Anzio Annie, and it's probably from this that the M65 derived its nickname. The M65 gun was of 11-inch calibre, and though surprisingly mobile using two powered tractor units, it was unwieldy compared to conventional artillery. And in time, smaller warheads, accommodated in smaller shells, would see the M65 rendered obsolete, with the US's conventional heavy artillery able to fire these smaller nuclear shells. Of course, the US Navy had no such problem of mobility for guns of 11-inch calibre and more. When I first started looking into this, I felt sure that the US Navy of the 1950s would have looked at the 16-inch guns of the Iowa-class battleships and the Army's 11-inch atomic shells and grinned, and I was not disappointed. The M65 initially fired a W9 shell with a yield of 15 kilotons, and this was further developed into the W19 with a yield of 15 to 20 kilotons. And it was this latter design which was adapted with a 16-inch casing to form the W23 atomic shell for the Iowa's main battery. The yield remaining the same at 15 to 20 kilotons. Incidentally, this is the range of yields, the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs, which were dropped 10 years previously. W23s were manufactured from 1956, with a total of around 50 being produced, and these were held in stockpiles until 1962. I've not been able to discover quite what the tactical doctrine might have been, for the use of these atomic shells, at least hypothetically. The title of the video is probably somewhat hyperbolic, as with an atomic warhead, one shell is probably all that's needed to get the job done. That said, with a theoretical maximum of 180 kilotons from nine 16-inch guns, this must undoubtedly be the greatest firepower ever boasted by a battleship main battery. So there we are, I do hope you found that interesting. I have to say, when I first came across this, it really ticked a lot of boxes for me in terms of interests, battleships, naval warfare, uh, the very early period of tactical nuclear weapons where they were being applied to all sorts of different applications. And as I say, I just thought it was interesting and something that would, might be of interest to, to you guys as well. 
as I say, I'd be interested to find out more about the sort of tactical doctrine behind how these may have been used hypothetically. I've not been able to find any information on that, but going forward, if I do, I might make a part two to this talking about that. Uh, as I say, quite uh, quite the uh, interesting weapon system to have a, a battleship firing nuclear shells, I think. As I say, never actually put to use, but an interesting hypothetical of how it might have been used. As I say, I do hope you found that interesting. If you have and you'd like to see more of this sort of thing, and obviously my videos looking at military and so forth, please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the little notification button down below, which will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you'd like to support the channel, you can. There's both a Patreon and a PayPal link down below. And as ever, a massive thank you to everybody who supports me using those methods. It's greatly appreciated, guys. Thank you very much indeed. If you'd like to keep up with the channel on social media, you can. There's Facebook, Instagram and Twitter all linked down below as well. And if you want to make contact but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down there as well. But that's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now. <laughs>